the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award this various Riksbank Prize, in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel 2020 to Paul R. Milgram and Robert B. Wilson, for improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. The new auction formats are a beautiful example of how basic research can subsequently generate inventions that benefit society. The unusual feature of this example is that the same people developed the theory and the practical applications. The laureate's groundbreaking research about auctions has thus been of great benefit, for buyers, sellers and society as a whole. Auction theory is an applied branch of economics which deals with how people act in auction markets and researches the properties of auction markets. Milgram and Wilson not only for their basic research into the behavior of auction participants, but for their application of those findings to design better auctions. Milgram and Wilson developed a complex form of auction, the simultaneous multiple round auction. This allows bidding for more than one thing at the same time and allows repeated bids. It is useful, for example, if a company wants to bid for a license in one area only if it can also have the license in another area. In the 1990s, the US Federal Communications Commission put this theory to work to better allocate radio frequency bands to telecom and media companies. The agency previously allocated spectrum using license applications and random lotteries. By using Milgram and Wilson's auction format, designed to counter the problems of uncertain values and the winner's curse, the new FCC spectrum auctions drove billions of dollars in sales over the next 20 years. The format has since been adopted by other countries, including the United Kingdom, India, and Canada, to improve their allocation of not just radio frequency bands, but also other assets like carbon emission allowances. Some governments, auction off the right to pollute in hopes of reducing emissions, cleaner companies can resell unneeded rights to dirtier ones, creating a financial incentive for companies to make their operations greener. A corrective tax controls the source of pollution by imposing proper taxes, but the policy of tradable pollution permits deal with the environmental issues by allocating annual pollution permits by countries and by companies. Companies that cannot reduce the allocated amount of pollution can purchase their quota from another company. In this way, the tradable pollution permit allows the market to control the total amount of pollution and companies can efficiently allocate their pollution permits regardless of their quota. Since the first greenhouse gas exchange was established in England in 2002, international emissions trading markets have been formed in many countries. Tradable pollution permits are a market-based policy like a corrective tax. Returning to the previous example, let us suppose that the government adopts the regulation and requires each factory to reduce its pollution to 300 tons of waste per year, and both factories comply well. Next, if both factories make a consensus and ask the government to authorize the following deal, should the government allow the two factories to make this deal? Of course, the government should allow it. From the standpoint of economic efficiency, allowing the deal is beneficial to both of them. Moreover, the deal does not have any external effects because the total amount of pollution remains the same. Thus, social welfare is enhanced by allowing the paper factory to sell its pollution rights to the steel factory. The invisible hand will ensure that this new market allocates the right to pollute efficiently. Thus, the permits will end up in the hands of those firms that value them most highly, as judged by their willingness to pay. A firm's willingness to pay for the right to pollute, in turn, will depend on its cost of reducing pollution. Pollution permits and corrective taxes have much in common. Both corrective taxes and pollution permits internalize the externality of pollution by making it costly for firms to pollute. The similarity of the two policies can be seen by considering the market for pollution. The demand curve for the right to pollute has a downward slope. Because the lower the price of polluting, the more firms will choose to pollute. In a corrective tax, the supply curve for pollution right is perfectly elastic. 
This is because the government allowed firms to pollute as much as they want by paying the tax. Thus, the demand curve for pollution rights shows a downward slope and the supply curve is horizontal. When the government uses a corrective tax to fix the price of pollution rights, the position of the demand curve determines the quantity of pollution. On the contrary, if the government sets a quantity of pollution instead of a price, the supply curve for pollution right is perfectly inelastic. Because the quantity of pollution is fixed by the government, under tradable pollution permits, the position of the demand curve determines the price of pollution. Tradable pollution permits allow the government to adopt a corrective tax. For example, suppose the government wants no more than 600 tons of glop dumped into the river. If the EPA does not know the demand curve for pollution, it won't know the corrective tax for a total emission of 600 tons. In this case, it can simply auction off 600 tons of pollution permits and set the market equilibrium price as the appropriate size of the corrective tax. Initially, Many people were skeptical of pollution permits, but over time, the system is now widely viewed as a cost-effective way of keeping the environment clean. Ten Principles of Economics How Markets Work Principles of Firm Behavior Principles of Income Distribution and Frontiers of Economics Principles of National Economy How Money and Exchange Rates Work How Economic Fluctuations and Economic Policy Work Translated into six languages and exported to the world The people of the world enjoy economics.